The energy sector is rapidly changing from the growth in natural gas and clean energy resources to the evolving electricity market structures and the expansion of distributed energy resources such as rooftop solar and energy storage. There's also a sizable increase in the cost and number of threats from natural disasters, cyber attacks, and other events, which impact energy infrastructure. State legislatures play a critical role in shaping energy policies that support the evolving energy sector and protect critical energy infrastructure. Hi, my name is Christy Hartman, and on behalf of NCSL's energy program, I welcome you to, to this exciting session where you hear from several NCSL experts who will discuss the biggest changes and developments to the energy sector, key policies coming before state legislatures, and what we anticipate for 2021. So to get things started off, right under your video player, you should see uh, a box for poll number one. Go ahead and select that, and you should see a question pop up that says, what is the most common cause of power outages in the US? Is it lightning strikes, birds, vehicle accidents, marijuana greenhouses, high energy demand, or squirrels? I'll give you about 20 seconds to read back through that question and select your response. Great to see all the responses coming in. And if you were in that 50% who selected squirrels, you did select the correct answer. Squirrels cause anywhere from 20 to 30% of power outages in the US. Um, another uh, large one is actually the lightning strikes. Uh, impacts from severe weather are also a very common cause of power outages. Now let's move on to that second poll question. So select poll number two, and you should see the question pop up. If you could only select one, uh, which of the following topics would you consider a top energy priority in your state in 2021? And there's a lot of choices here. Uh, renewable energy or energy efficiency, emissions reductions, grid modernization, transportation electrification, uh, energy security and resiliency, nuclear power, oil, natural gas, or coal, or other. And if it is other, if, if we haven't uh, mentioned the item that you think you'll focus on in your legislature, go ahead and put that in the chat box uh, to the right of your screen and let us know what that topic is. So again, I'll give you about 20 seconds to uh, select the topic that you will most focus on. Well, it's great to see uh, these responses coming in. Certainly, uh, you know, we feel that all of these topics are going to be coming before state legislatures. It's nice to see uh, what, what you all are seeing as sort of a primary priority. So we're gonna talk through a lot of these topics today. And if we don't talk specifically about them, um, you know, we, we are tracking this information. We have lots of, of resources on these policy topics. So I would, suggest reaching out to us. And I think that's a good segue to uh, a slide where we mainly just wanna share our content information and let you know who uh, the NCSL Energy team is. Uh, we have four staff in our Denver office and two colleagues in Washington, DC. You're going to hear from um, a number of my colleagues here on, on this slide today. But most importantly, uh, these slides will be available. And we wanted you to have our contact information. So please feel free to reach out if we can ever be of assistance. Now, I wanna spend just a couple minutes to talk through, you know, who are the primary federal and state stakeholders when it comes to setting energy policy? And I'd be remiss if I didn't start with a Fab Four, but as corny as that is, not that Fab Four, I'm talking about the Fab Four of federal energy agencies, the, the primary agencies that we uh, work with who have regulatory oversight over energy policy. So the Department of Energy, Environmental Protection Agency, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and the Department of Interior. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, two colleagues in Washington, D.C., who specifically focus on uh, the regulatory authority of these federal agencies, as well as looking at congressional action um, and their impact on the state. So if you ever have a question on sort of what's going on at the federal level, please reach out to my colleagues in Washington, D.C. And 
sort of the last slide from me, looking across who are the state stakeholders when it comes to setting energy policy. We're all most familiar, most likely with state legislatures and the role that state legislatures play in the policy making process. Certainly it could be from um, providing legislation that offers funding or incentives or restricts certain actions. What we also see, and this varies state by state certainly, but we see a lot of states who uh, the legislature must authorize the activities of the Public Utility Commission before we see that uh, commission take more specific action and oversight of the utility planning process. So uh, there's a lot of overlap between state legislatures and the work of the public utility commissions in your state. But there's also uh, the state energy offices or the governor's office who uh, may be writing reports that are then sent to the legislature looking at sort of different maybe study committees or, or actions related to energy. Uh, oftentimes these state agencies are really looking across the energy sector from the residential to commercial use and uh, sort of making sure that everyone is a part of the energy uh, policy process. And then lastly, uh, at the state level, you know, there may be sort of state utilities or the energy industry in the state that are certainly pushing um, certain resources or technologies or investing in programs. And, and I think the main part of this slide is to see uh, the policymaking process, especially when it comes to energy policy, is very complex. And all of these stakeholders play uh, an increasingly important role in, in the policymaking process. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Glenn Anderson, who's going to walk us through uh, the energy transformation and what we're seeing today. So with that, Glenn, I turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Christy. So at the turn of the last century, the advent of the gas powered automobile initiated a remarkably quick transformation of the transportation system with cars rapidly filling the streets and ushering in a new era of mobility and reshaping cities. So here are two pictures um, of New York's Fifth Avenue on Easter Sunday. In 1900 and 1913. And they illustrate the massive technological change that occurred in just 13 years, with the large transition from horse drawn carriages to gas powered automobiles. So if you look closely, there's something that stands out as unique in each of these pictures. What is it? Well, some of you may have figured it out, but uh, you'll note that in 1900, there was just one automobile present on Easter Sunday, while in 1913, there was just one horse-drawn carriage. This really illustrates the massive change that uh, occurred in just 13 years with the status quo becoming obsolete. So the energy sector is now undergoing a similarly profound transformation, bringing with it an exciting array of opportunities and a multiplicity of challenges. The rapidly shifting energy mix is a clear indicator of this transformation. So King Cole, a leader in electricity generation for more than 100 years, has fallen from providing half our electricity in 2006 to just 20% 20 in 2020. As noted in the chart, renewable electricity consumption has advanced quickly, edging out coal for the first time in 2019. Economics is really a major driver in this transition. With wind and solar, um, now uh, being able to replace 75 or 74 percent of U.S. coal fleet at an immediate savings to customers, and by 2025, this number is expected to grow to 86 percent. And what are the other drivers? So, customer preference, along with economics, has led utilities to incorporate larger percentages of renewables into their portfolios and set high goals for clean renewable energy. 
In fact, 70% of the nation's largest utilities have stated that they are planning to reduce carbon emissions by at least 80% by mid-century. And when it comes to policy, nine states have passed legislative mandates to reach 100% clean renewable energy by mid-century, and 30 states have renewable energy requirements. So let's explore these new disruptive technologies. So renewables are leading in new capacity installations, making up three fourths of the total electricity generation capacity installed in 2020. Solar installations reached a record high um, last year and wind power continued to expand as well with 10 states now getting more than 20% of their electricity from wind. So which states do you think get the largest amount of their electricity from wind? Well, wind has become a leading, re, uh, leading source of electricity in both Iowa and Kansas just in the last year. Um, both states are now meeting more than 40% of the electricity needs with wind. And uh, in Texas, which is by far the nation's largest electricity consumer, um, close to 60% of electricity needs are being met with wind power for short periods of time during the year. Now, heading into 2021, the US Energy Information Administration forecasts that wind and solar resources will continue to dominate. Nearly 40% of new capacity additions will be solar although the total percentage will likely be much higher since this forecast is for utility scale only and does not include the contributions of new rooftop solar installations, which are expected to expand quite uh, significantly as well. And a new player in the energy market, battery storage, is likely to see installations more than quadruple. The rapid growth of renewables is a major driver in the expansion of battery storage systems, which are increasingly paired with renewables. So the advent of new smart technologies, such as energy storage, distributed energy generation, microgrids, electric vehicles, and demand response are completely reshaping how energy is produced, managed, and used. And this illustration shows how the centralized grid compares to this distributed grid. While the distributed grid still includes large utility scale power generation, there's far more action happening within the smaller distribution grid where rooftop solar, small gas turbines, electric storage, or sorry, energy storage, smart building technologies are helping to meet grid needs at the local level. And new grid technologies and energy management approaches are reducing the need for large baseload generation to help balance the grid, allowing many smaller distributed resources to play the role once filled by these larger plants. And this is a fascinating development since it allows utilities to add smaller resources as needed closer to the points of consumption rather than committing to large capital investment and the risk attached to building a big centralized power station. Electricity markets are moving from a centralized grid with one-way energy flow towards a multi-directional energy flow uh, happening on the grid, involving a far greater number of market participants as well. In addition, consumers are playing a more active role and now participating in both energy production and energy management on the grid. So legislators are considering a raft of policies to support the energy transition and take advantage of the economic development opportunities that it offers. Critical aspect of the modern grid is the modern, is modern utility regulatory structure. Now utility regulation reform is vital to grid modernization since the regulatory framework that evolved around the centralized grid needs to be updated to provide a level playing field for new technologies. The traditional regulatory framework rewards regulated utilities with a return on capital investments, even if they are not the lowest cost approaches to meeting system needs. The traditional method also rewards utilities for selling more electricity. 
This leaves utilities with the choice to propose supply side capital expenditure, uh, supply side capital expenditures that recover shareholder investments with a profit or to propose lower cost demand side solutions that are better for customers, but sacrifice earnings and utility process, uh, profits. To address this conundrum, states are exploring and implementing new performance-based approaches that align utility and customer goals by rewarding utilities for reaching new targets and meeting customer needs in areas like energy efficiency, reliability, grid modernization, public safety, and customer service. Another uh, area being considered for uh, policy is called uh, securitization. Um, with the old infrastructure becoming uneconomic in a number uh, of, of states, uh, there are a number of actions being considered and, and being enacted. And for instance, Colorado, New Mexico, and Montana have all three passed legislation to allow securitization um, of economic utility assets. Now, these policies allow utilities to refinance and retire undepreciated power plants, reducing the cost and risk of retiring these assets, which are often coal plants, and providing a large savings to consumers. This allows utilities to more quickly transition to a cleaner and more efficient grid. And while I don't have time to cover the large variety of approaches that policymakers have, uh, have been implementing, we encourage you to visit uh, our website and see our NCSL publication, Modernizing the Electric Grid, for more details on the policy options listed on this slide. Now, one of the issues uh, or topics I talked about as being transformative is energy storage. This is a relatively new technology that provides a remarkable array of benefits, including resilience and reliability by countering the efforts of those rascally squirrels, for example, and enabling the integration of large amounts of low cost intermittent resources, such as wind and solar. Energy storage can also help address the so-called duck curve issue that results when solar makes up a significant portion of electricity uh, electricity generation and requires a large amount of flexible energy resources to quickly ramp up production as solar outputs uh, wane in the early evening. Now states have been very active in energy storage over the past year with uh, in 2020, 200 bills being introduced uh, and considered, and 33 being enacted. Now, there's been a range of policy approaches that have been uh, considered um, from resource planning, installation targets, financial incentives, and research and demonstration. Um, I also want to uh, note that NCSL has a brand new uh, informational um, resource our energy storage database that has just gone live today. So feel free to visit our uh, energy webpage and take a look at the legislation database. So next, I'll hand it off to my colleague, Laura Shields. Great, thanks so much, Glenn. I'm gonna build upon some of the foundational issues that Glenn talked about today and say a little bit more about the climate and clean energy policies that states have been considering and that may come up in your state. So what's driving a lot of the policy activity in states across the country relating to climate and clean energy is policy goals related to reducing emissions. And so I've kind of included a roadmap of where I'm gonna to go today. Uh, but starting off, uh, a major tool for states is a statutory greenhouse gas reduction policy. Um, a number of states have enacted such a policy and, and will continue to do so or consider such policies in the coming years. Additionally, there's more targeted policies focused on reducing emissions from the electricity sector. So this is your clean energy standard or your renewable energy standard. Um, I'd invite you to uh, either put in the chat or make a list of those nine states and 
two additional jurisdictions that have 100% clean energy standards. And um, feel free to think about that. And we'll, we'll get to the answer a little bit later on in my presentation. Um, that states are also actively considering building efficiency policies focused on conserving more energy in buildings in addition to reducing emissions. There's also been a ton of activity focused on clean transportation and electrification of the transportation sector in particular. Diving into clean and renewable energy standards, your traditional renewable portfolio standard, which the vast majority of states have enacted, really focuses on uh, requiring utilities to deliver a certain amount of electricity from renewable energy sources to end, end use consumers. And now we're seeing states, in addition to kind of revisiting those policies to ratchet up those requirements to a higher percentage by a certain year, we're also seeing policies that open up that resource category to encompass you know, non-traditional renewable resources. So going beyond traditional solar and wind to encompass technologies that are zero emitting or zero carbon. So for those of you who had a list that looks like the dark blue and teal states up on the map, you were right on the mark. Uh, this map essentially aims to show those states in the, the dark blue that have both statutory greenhouse gas reduction requirements in addition to a 100% clean energy or electricity sector requirement in statute. Uh, the teal states are those with a 100% clean statute uh, but not a statutory greenhouse gas reduction requirement. And those states in the green are your economy-wide greenhouse gas reduction states. And just to note that this map does not include all those actions that may be carried out through the executive, but mainly focuses on those requirements in statute. Building efficiency continues to be a main priority for states. One kind of policy tool that we've seen be used is to revisit energy efficiency codes to ensure that the, the state's code reflects the most current version of standards available. And this kind of sets the statewide minimum. There's also voluntary stretch codes for local governments that allow for uh, locals, <laughs> local governments to adopt standards that are more aggressive than the statewide minimums if they so choose. And so to kind of ratchet up that energy conservation, there's also your net zero and greenhouse gas reduction targets for buildings really focused on achieving emissions reductions uh, rather than on specific design features that are prominent in your energy efficiency code. There's also benchmarking, which is a really useful tool for uh, gathering data about actual energy conservation in buildings and then sharing that data. With transportation electrification, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time talking about various policies that we've seen considered in states across the country, mostly just because we've seen a ton of activity and interest in these policies. And so it's worth spending a little bit more time. The roadmap for this section includes incentives. Think of your kind of traditional direct financial incentives in addition to exemptions, use of HOV lanes, things of that nature. There's also a ton of interest in charging infrastructure, how to create a favorable regulatory environment to encourage developing charging infrastructure. We've also seen a lot of interest in states across the country on enacting special fees for plug-in electric vehicles. And this directly relates to declining gas tax revenues in states uh, that's due not only to electric vehicles, but we've seen it kind of adopted as a, po a popular policy response to that issue. And so uh, I want to reach out to the audience and see if you all have any thoughts about whether it's true or false that the majority of states have statutory fees for EVs and bonus points for anyone that can write down or include in the chat uh, the exact number of states with such a policy. I'll also briefly talk about vehicle emission standards as kind of a tool for encouraging uh, electric vehicle adoption as well as public and private fleet requirements. So in thinking about incentives that we've seen state legislatures kind of contemplate through legislation, 
credits and rebates, kind of your direct financial incentives on vehicles or infrastructure are a really popular policy tool. Uh, so are exemptions, preferential parking, use of HOV lanes, as I mentioned, exemptions from vehicle emission standards, all kinds of policies to uh, encourage drivers to, to buy an EV. There's also reduced utility rates, so price reductions for off-peak charging. Think of your time of use rate. These policies are implemented by utilities, but legislatures can enact legislation kind of directing a public utility commission to open up a docket evaluating these issues or creating the authority for utilities to uh, request that such a regulation be in place. With charging structure, a lot of focus has been on creating, as I mentioned, a favorable regulatory environment to encourage charging stations to be built. And so that relates to your incentives, but it also relates to uh, an area that we've seen a lot of state activity in, which is to exempt private electric vehicle service providers. So think of your non-utility electric vehicle charging service provider from regulation as a public utility. So kind of lessening the regulatory burden for those entities. And you'll see those states uh, in kind of the light light orange highlighted, those are the states that have in statute exempted private electric vehicle service providers from regulation as a utility under the jurisdiction of the Public Utility Commission. States are also starting to focus on setting kind of minimum standards around charging services. So clearly posting where charging locations are physically located or setting minimum standards for pricing and accessibility. And so we anticipate that states will continue to uh, weigh these types of policies as uh, charging infrastructure continues to be built in, in, their, in their jurisdictions. Circling back to EVPs, so those of you who uh, answered true <laughs> that the majority of states do have special fees for EVs, you'd be correct, and bonus points for anyone who said 28 states, because that is the number. <laughs> and we do see states that continue to weigh these policies. Um, and as I mentioned, this is directly related to ensuring that electric vehicle drivers you know, pay equitably for using transportation infrastructure. As you can see, the ranges for fees across states varies dramatically from $50 in some states all the way up to $225 in others. Um, and so as states continue to kind of revisit these policies, we expect that maybe these fee amounts will change. Another policy uh, tool that I wanted to highlight in that our transportation program covered as part of their 101 presentation, in case you missed that, are road user charges. And these fees more closely link um, the fee to the actual use of the roadways. And so they're kind of growing in interest uh, for those states who are looking to address these types of gas tax revenue shortfalls that I mentioned. You can see up there that a, a number of states are considering these policies and, and we expect them to continue to do so. If you have any questions about road user charges, I'd be more than happy to connect you with our transportation folks. They have a really good handle on this policy. I also wanted to briefly mention vehicle emission standards. States continue to look at Section 177 of the Clean Air Act to adopt vehicle emission standards based on California's program. And 10 states have adopted the ZEV standards under California's program. And Washington was kind of a recent example of a state to enact legislation on this topic. And the, the ZEV standards require that a certain percentage of new cars, passenger cars sold in the state be zero emission vehicles. States are looking to use section 177. This, this creates the authority for states to adopt vehicle emission standards more aggressive or more stringent than federal requirements. And they're looking at that again for the California's recently um, promulgated advanced clean trucks regulation. And this regulation focuses on the medium and heavy duty sector of vehicles. States are also looking at fleet policies. So the majority of states have public fleet requirements. This relates to requiring that a certain amount of maybe new vehicle purchases be zero emission vehicles or electric vehicles or alternative fuel vehicles. And that's the requirement for you know, state owned vehicles, state fleets. States are continuing to revisit these policies and maybe ratchet up requirements, but they're also starting to look at 
pub, uh, private fleets in addition to public fleets. And so a recent example is out of California, focusing on reducing greenhouse gas emissions from transportation network companies. So think Uber and Lyft. And other states are also kind of weighing legislation that focuses on reducing emissions from private fleets and transportation network companies. EV direct sales. So this issue kind of directly goes to the heart of how uh, consumers are able to access EVs. And so kind of with the rise of Tesla and their direct to consumer models, states have kind of gone back and revisited their dealer franchise laws, which generally prohibit manufacturers from engaging in direct sales to consumers. Up on the map, you'll see those states that have a limited, uh, have allowed a limited direct sales of vehicles for, for electric vehicles. Um, and those states in dark orange are those that have a process in place that arguably allow for new market participants, so less limitations um, regarding direct sales. We expect states to potentially go back and continue to revisit these policies to decide whether the narrow exceptions that they created in the past for maybe current market participants, market participants shouldn't be opened up or should be opened up um, to allow for new market participants wanting to engage in direct sales. I'll wrap up by highlighting just some other climate and clean energy policies that I didn't have a chance to get to today, but did just want to highlight for you, and I won't go into each one of these, but did just want to spend a little bit of time talking about equity and environmental justice. Uh, we've just seen a ton of focus on this in state legislatures across the country, and there's been a lot of uh, wrapping these types of provisions into broad climate and clean energy packages or standalone legislation. And so this can look like creating an environmental justice council or maybe enhanced stakeholder requirements for impacted communities. Maybe it's a percentage spending requirement for clean energy investments in those communities most impacted by pollution. Uh, so with that, I won't go into any more on the slide, but we'll turn things over to my colleague, Dan Shea. All right, thanks, Laura. Happy to be with you today. Glad you're interested in energy as uh, Glenn and Laura have demonstrated really well. It is a fascinating time to be working on these issues. There's so much change, so much, so many dynamic issues, and uh, that means there's also a lot to cover today. So I'm going to dive right in and get moving. So we have plenty of time for questions at the end. So I've chosen to use a catch-all term to begin with, energy security. It can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, uh, but generally we're talking about how well energy systems react to or how well they're insulated against anomalies, disruptions to normal operations. Those could have to do with anomalies in fuel supply like the 1970s oil crisis, but lately public policy has been more focused on squirrels, right? Clearly the ban of the electric grid, and it's true by number, the most persistent threat to the electric grid but I'm sure as many of you probably realize, squirrels are not in fact the most pressing concern. We're mainly talking about weather related disasters, cyber attacks, terrorism, and yes, pandemics. To jump into the topic, I'd like to start with a graphic from the Edison Electric Institute. Now, I don't want anyone to feel like they need to take in all of the individual icons. It's, it's a lot to take in. So I realize that, but mostly I like it because it's a nice visual of the way electric utilities view the various anomalies and helps determine how they prepare for them or don't. On the y-axis, you have the frequency of an event or basically the likelihood that it will occur. Top left, that's squirrels. The x-axis represents the potential consequences of an event, how destructive, disruptive, or costly to recover from. You can see the tornado icon near the top center and that represents natural disasters. Uh, and it shows a high degree of frequency coupled with high consequences. And this is why utilities do have vegetation management plans, uh, tree trimming to protect lines during storms, and why they don't have squirrel mitigation plans. We've seen a lot of state policy recently in response to natural disasters. But as you can see, that's far from the only threat to energy systems. You have physical security risks, you have cyber attacks, and you have other concerns that aren't considered as likely, such as global pandemics. Uh, if you're interested later, you can always take a closer look at this graphic. It's uh, pretty interesting for anyone with a healthy fascination in these types of morbid subjects. Uh, in any event, utilities have prepared for these scenarios in various ways and to varying degrees. Some of these preparedness activities are mandated by states, often through directives from the state legislature. 
Others are mandated by federal agencies and some are part of industry-led efforts. The problem as always is how to spend the available resources. There's only so much money. This type of cost benefit analysis means that utilities are most often focused on the stuff that's high up and farther to the right, which brings us to weather events. Okay, continuing on this trend of presenting really discouraging information and highly congested visual images. Uh, this one might require a tutorial. It's uh, NOAA's billion dollar disaster chart. It shows major disasters since the agency began tracking them in 1980. These are natural disasters where the overall damage for an individual event uh, reached or exceeded a billion dollars. The bars are populated by the number of disasters in a given year. So the taller the bar, the more disasters. Uh, the red and gray lines indicate the combined costs of that year's disasters. So those big and red, uh, big and those red and gray spikes, those big ones you can associate those with disasters we all recognize like Katrina, Sandy, and Maria. Um, the short version is that we're seeing more disasters and we're seeing more destructive disasters. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, that doesn't sound like a great combination, then you're absolutely right. The 2010s were by far the most devastating decade yet, uh, both in terms of cost and the number of events. The average cost since 2010 has been over $100 billion annually. Any guesses on what that figure was for the 1980s? You can go ahead and type any guesses into the chat. Okay, so the answer is just under $13 billion annually. That's about an eight-fold increase. Uh, clearly, all of this uh, costs money, uh, but not only in terms of restoration and recovery. Lost productivity, lost output, these events cost the U.S. economy tens of billions of dollars every year, and the brunt of that is borne by the commercial and industrial sectors. So resiliency has a value, but what is that value? The National Academy of Building Sciences estimates that for every dollar spent on mitigation before a disaster, $6 of response and restoration costs are avoided. But that's buildings, not power. And there's no widely accepted metric that, has, uh, that helps quantify this return on investment for damage that isn't done or power that isn't interrupted. It's the source of a lot of debate uh, in the energy sector, not only in terms of resiliency, but other topics as well, like factoring in emissions or flexibility. So what are states doing about it? Well, one thing you can say is that disasters bring people together. And that seems equally true for the legislature. With all the, dis the destruction we've seen recently, there has been a lot of momentum to move policy that addresses these issues, even when there's a big price tag. On the front end, state legislatures have enhanced mitigation and planning requirements. Those plans have to be approved by state regulators and updated reg regularly. Uh, they identify risks and get utilities and state agencies on the same page for when a disaster does strike. Uh, grid hardening initiatives have also been successful. And this is the really big news because these investments are not cheap. When I talk about grid hardening, I'm talking about strategic investments in particularly vulnerable areas, such as flood mitigation for low-lying substations, replacing old wooden poles with concrete ones in high wind areas, or even undergrounding some lines. Uh, California, Florida, Nevada, and Utah have all been active here in recent years. Another area of focus has been around microgrids and backup power, uh, especially for critical faci facilities and community shelters. Backup power is exactly that, usually a diesel generator that kicks on when the power goes out. Microgrids also provide backup power, but they're much more complex systems that also operate in tandem with the grid during normal operations. After Superstorm Sandy, Connecticut and several other affected states worked extensively on microgrid policies, and quite a few more have joined in since. They funded pilot projects, enabled state-backed funding mechanisms, uh, basically tried to help get these projects to overcome the early hurdles and financing issues, because as, as I mentioned, resiliency isn't always easy to cost into a project. Finally, let's look at the back end, service restoration. As a utility representative told me, when it comes to sustained 150 mile an hour winds and higher, the power is gonna go out somewhere. It's inevitable. Even if the concrete pole is still standing, the wire's torn down and we can't afford to place every line underground. So restoration is key and planning and hardening play into that because when all you have to do is string up a wire and not replace an entire pole, you're going to restore power to people much, much quicker. And efficient and quick restoration also requires planning and addition, in addition to state required plans, utilities rely on mutual assistance agreements that often bring in utility crews from unaffected states, sometimes many states away. 
at least 23 states have relaxed licensing and tax requirements for out-of-state response crews to facilitate that work. And that, perhaps in a very large nutshell, is resiliency. Let's talk cybersecurity. Uh, as you can see, while legislation on cybersecurity related to energy and critical infrastructure has doubled over the past two years, it's still very much a niche subject. The total number of bills is not very high probably because a lot of state legislatures are still grappling with what, if anything, they should do about it. It's new, it's very complicated once you dig in, and it hasn't been abundantly clear what the state role should be. However, with the increasing frequency and sophistication of attacks, it's important and it's pressing. I'm, I'm sure some of you even read about the recent cyber attack on the water utility in Florida recently. The good news is that there's a lot state legislatures can do because much of the electric and gas distribution systems fall under state jurisdiction. State legislatures set policy for utility commissions, which use that policy and statutory authority to regulate the utilities. This can include imposing cybersecurity requirements. There's a, a lot of nuance to this when it comes to municipal utilities and cooperatives, but the bottom line is that state legislatures can make that decision. In terms of policy, uh, this uncertainty has led a number of states to establish st study committees to explore the topic and make recommendations. More substantial policies have addressed planning and reporting requirements or uh, required utilities to implement specific cybersecurity standards. In some cases, like Connecticut and Texas, states have empowered commissions to conduct cyber reviews, uh, communicate best practices, and make recommendations to those utilities. But it's worth noting that the state regulator is still limited in, in those scenarios. We're not talking about mandates, but basically strongly worded suggestions. And I want to highlight uh, the issue of flexible financing for security investments. Uh, now, it, it, this hasn't actually been done explicitly in many states. Texas did enact uh, flexible cost recovery and financing in 2019, and many utilities have expressed concern that traditional rate cases, the way their investments are normally approved, that those methods are too cumbersome. Uh, cybersecurity programs need to be agile to be able to respond to the app, and they require continuous, flexible. Well, it looks like Dan may have uh, may have a frozen screen, so I'll go ahead and just sort of wrap up. Certainly, there is a ton going on in the cybersecurity space um, that that maybe if he can get back online, he can talk about a little bit. You know, there was sort of two final points that I think he was going to bring up. The biggest being, uh, you know, it's sort of impressive that we made it this far in the presentation. Uh, without talking about the coronavirus and its impacts on the energy sector. So we're saving that for right towards the end. But there's sort of three main ways that COVID-19 has really impacted uh, the energy sector. And Dan, you back online. So if you want to jump in here, uh, please feel free. Sorry about that. Uh, I am back online. Um, so yes, thanks, Christy, for taking over. Um, but yeah, so I'll start out talking about disconnections. Um, uh, so at least 33 states, DC and Puerto Rico moved to temporarily suspend utility disconnections, while most of the remaining states asked utilities to voluntarily do so. Many of these actions were taken by utility commissions, but at least 10 state legislatures acted, uh, and some required utilities to negotiate repayment plans with customers. However, those policies, while addressing an immediate concern, may be exacerbating another problem, and that is lost utility revenue. By some estimates, utilities may be dealing with up to $40 billion in unpaid bills by March of this year. This increase in unpaid bills, coupled with uh, a drop in energy consumption over the past year, has led to revenue shortfalls for some utilities. To date, most of the work on this has taken place within utility commissions. Uh, many PUCs have authority to address losses, but the uncertainty and scale of the current crisis means that PUCs are largely navigating uncharted waters and clear guidance from the legislature could help, uh, which is what California did it, it, when it passed a bill in the fall to give PUCs some direction and allow fixed charges to recover verified revenue shortfalls. Um, it securitized the losses to avoid massive near-term rate hikes and mostly gave the PUC clear authority and direction in how to proceed. 
Another issue has been essential worker designations. At least 43 states issued guidance on essential workers, mostly through governor's orders, um, all of which included the energy sector. Uh, but the speed and uncertainty around this process was a concern within the industry. Basically, it raised this question. Under what emergency scenario would the energy sector not be considered essential? The industry is responsible for essential services that enable other essential services. There has been discussion about whether legislatures should consider establishing permanent blanket designations that don't require a governor's actions, especially for workers in universally critical industries like energy, communications, and water. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to get into the legislative oversight of uh, gubernatorial powers. There are people at NCSL much better suited to this discussion than me, and we have some great resources on that. Uh, suffice it to say, there were a lot of sweeping executive orders last year, and some legislators felt the orders went too far and that governors failed to consult the, the legislator uh, adequately. Um, and finally, the pandemic's economic toll has also strained workforce issues, so I suppose it's fitting that we finish on that note. So I'm going to start off this, the final slide, with one more question, because hopefully you're still engaged, or at least still in the room, and maybe you like trivia. So what percent of the U.S. workforce is employed in the energy sector? Go ahead. You can put any guesses into the chat. Uh, don't worry. We're almost at the Q&A, and you'll be able to put your questions to us. All right. So I'm going to give the answer now. It's 4.6%. Uh, so that's pretty substantial. We're talking about 6.7 million Americans, around the same number of uh, people employed by the construction sector. But even as clean energy, uh, clean energy jobs grow, lost jobs in the fossil fuel industries, and coal especially, have been a major concern. Workforce issues have become critical for two primary reasons. The first is that the existing workforce is aging out. There are oncoming large-scale retirements. Number two, that coupled with the substantial transitions taking place, the, the horse to car seismic shift that Glenn talked about, all of that means that there are a lot of new types of jobs and new technologies that even seasoned workers would need to be trained on. So what's that translate to policy-wise? Well, mostly training and training and more training, in addition to assistance to help communities and workers from being left out during the transition. States are addressing, uh, they're looking at growing new green jobs with a focus on funding apprenticeships and training programs. They've enacted uh, policies granting state tax incentives or credits for companies that create new jobs in certain sectors. Several states have also expressed support for small modular nuclear reactors with a particular focus on the jobs, advanced manufacturing, and other economic activity associated with that industry. Um, and finally, Colorado, um, uh, and several other states have worked to soften the blow of the energy transition. Uh, these policies focus on identifying workers and communities uh, that are likely to be affected uh, and helping to transition them into new jobs and help uh, local economies diversify. And finally, there's a focus on emerging sectors, such as cybersecurity, energy storage. Uh, this can include training um, staff, uh, either in industry or in state programs, uh, to be able to fulfill their jobs. Um, and so it seems like we're going to continue to see states act in this area to uh, ensure that the energy sector is well positioned uh, as these big transformations take place. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Christy, and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you, everyone, so much. Well, thank you, Dan, and uh, thank you, Laura and Glenn. I know we've covered a ton of different energy topics. Um, I did want to mention, you know, a couple items we have. Uh, some resources available on the web page. It covers a whole bunch of different topics and certainly is not comprehensive. Uh, one of the items, because we're covering so many different energy policies here today, one of the items that I wanted to highlight were uh, next week we should be releasing our 2020-2021 sort of legislative energy trends report. This covers uh, a whole bunch of topics that we discussed today as well as others, you know, more focused on fossil fuels and nuclear and uh, grid modernization and, and other topics. And so um, be on the lookout for that. I think it's a great tool to be able to kind of quickly spotlight uh, a few different state legislative action over the last year and sort of where we think we're headed in 2021. Um, so with that, it's great to see my colleagues, including uh, Ben Hush from our Washington DC office. Um, it, with us today. I've gotten a few questions sort of directly, so I think I will start opening up to the group, but I encourage 
anyone participating today, if you have a question, you know, put it in the Q&A tab or in the chat box and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So, um, you know, I think to start off, one of the questions that came in uh, mentioned, you know, what are sort of the other energy topics that we are really seeing kind of trending coming before state legislatures and what do we expect in 2021? Are there sort of other energy topic areas that weren't discussed specifically in the presentation that you'd like to mention? And so I open it up to my colleagues to see who'd like to answer. I'll jump in real quick and just mention um, the, the issue of, of nuclear power has been one that has come up regularly over the past um, handful of years. And um, states are both considering ways to uh, support existing nuclear uh, generation, uh, but they're also considering new nuclear and what that may look like, um, in, including small modular reactors, as I mentioned, uh, uh, near the end of the presentation, but also sort of in terms of advanced nuclear. So that's something we're definitely tracking. I guess kind of on that, Dan, and I'll push it back to you again. Um, you know, I think we spent a lot of time in the presentation today sort of highlighting legislation that supported renewables and clean energy broadly over the last year, because that has been sort of a trending kind of policy topic. But can you give any sort of specific examples of maybe other areas that where it's supporting a specific resource? Yeah, absolutely. Um, last year, Wyoming um, actually took two uh, very innovative uh, approaches to this topic. They um, obviously Wyoming relies uh, heavily on uh, coal generation um, and they are concerned about reliability issues as uh, some other states have expressed as well uh, around the variability of renewable resources. And one of the things that they have, uh, they did last year was to um, try and pass a low carbon standard that would essentially, uh, was, was geared toward dispatchable baseload resources such as coal and nuclear that can essentially provide the power uh, on demand as asked by grid operators. Um, so one of the things that that would have done uh, is to um, outfit coal plants with uh, carbon capture and sequestration technology. Um, and in the event that that still doesn't work and, and that's just not economic, um, they sort of prioritized or expressed their, uh, tried to make it easier to site small modular reactors on this, where retired coal plants had been to um, again, have that sort of dispatchable power. Thanks, Dan. It's, it's certainly um, interesting developments uh, and uh, unique policy options, at least coming before the state. Um, so kind of switching over and, and adding in sort of the federal um, activities. There was one question that, that came in sort of talking about um, the new administration's priorities and this sort of focus on climate change. And so, um, you know, what should states focus on to lower greenhouse gas emissions or what are, what are examples of what states are already doing? And um, I think it's sort of two parts. Maybe the first, then I'd start with you of, of sort of that broadly, um, how sort of federal activities impact state energy policy. And then maybe second, uh, turn to my colleagues, Laura and Glenn, to talk through maybe some state policies for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, given that that's an administration priority. Sure, thanks, Christy, and hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Um, so I'll offer kind of two examples, but can give more if, if we have time. So the first one in terms of you know, federal policy impacts on states, I would actually return to something Laura brought up, which I think is a great example, um, and that deals with um, emissions from motor vehicles and the power that states have to um, kind of join the standards that California has set because that is a kind of authority that is given to California and other states in the Clean Air Act. So um, we are, you know, seeing, I don't want to say a reversal, but we are, we are almost assuredly going to see a change in current federal standards for motor vehicle emissions. Um, so that is likely going to have an impact on states that chose to follow um, the standards that California has in place, especially if California changes their standards to match um, new federal standards. And the other one I will mention is um, on emissions from power plants, 
we are almost assuredly going to see a new rule from uh, the Environmental Protection Agency on power plant emissions. Um, as a very, very quick history, there was a rule from uh, EPA during the Obama administration, administration, which was never implemented. There was a rule that was put into effect by the EPA under, pres under former President Trump that was recently vacated uh, by the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. So we are almost assuredly going to get a, another rule on this topic from the Environmental Protection Agency now under President Biden. So. Those are just two kind of quick examples of um, areas where the federal of where federal policy could have a significant impact on states. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, and I'll just follow up um, and kind of just again highlight transportation as kind of a major sector where states are looking to reduce emissions through policy. Um, I'll also just note that as states are kind of revisiting setting greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, whether they're new targets or existing targets, they're really focused in on not just setting uh, statewide emissions reduction targets, but maybe creating certain requirements for certain sectors within those policies. And so that kind of aligns with really focusing in on you know, the power sector and transportation sector and kind of continuing to look for emissions reductions there. I'll also just say there's a lot of support around more specific energy resources. So states are looking at offshore wind and um, that could align with Biden administration policies. Um, in addition to um, looking at siting kind of commercial scale renewables and how that interacts with federal policy. I think those are two areas as well to pay attention to. Great, thank you. I would just, just, just add, I guess, on top of that, the state trends and uh, efforts, policy efforts related to grid modernization and the integration of high levels of variable renewables. So really, um, as states are trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, they are often implementing aggressive renewable energy uh, requirements. And to meet these requirements, there's a lot of structural changes that will need to happen um, with regards to uh, the, the grid, basically, grid infrastructure. So states are, are really exploring, well, how can we ensure that the infrastructure is flexible and resilient in integrating this fluctuating kind of um, resource and, and relying on it at a higher level. And really they're looking at um, ways to shape uh, also the, the way we consume. And so um, looking at uh, technology approaches such as demand response um, and, and energy management approaches that in incorporate more of kind of a regional uh, or I guess solutions on the distribution side that can really help shape the way we consume energy and maximize our ability to um, create a flexible grid. Great, thank you, Glenn. And um, kind of wanted to step back uh, since Dan had sort of mentioned nuclear and then uh, Tori seeing your, your question come in, I feel like it's one of those um, sort of the long-term storage and disposal of nuclear waste is sort of the never ending conversation. Um, I don't know, Ben, if there's any sort of updates that you can provide on Yucca or the federal level, sort of based on the lack of response in the chat. I don't think we have anyone from Nevada um, joining us today. Thanks, Christy. Um, I, I think to your point in terms of the never ending question, um, you know, as I understand it, um, the Biden administration is expected to return to a process or strategy known as consent-based siting. I think we all have a very good understanding of where Nevada stands um, on consent for Yucca. Um, so I expect a you know general return to kind of where the process was, um, you know, maybe eight-ish years ago, unfortunately. Christy and I, I think it's probably worth mentioning as well, the industry initiative uh, to uh, site interim-based um, storage, uh, consolidated interim storage. 
facilities. There's two um, applications currently with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for uh, sites in uh, Western Texas and Eastern New Mexico. They're actually really not that far from each other. Um, and each of those would essentially um, bring in nuclear waste from uh, the plants throughout the country um, that are currently storing it on site and would essentially consolidate it in those facilities until a permanent solution has been found. Because no matter what the decision is on, on a permanent facility, that's going to take decades to uh, bring about regardless. So uh, this is viewed as a, that's why it's interim. It's viewed as an interim solution. And I'll just kind of finally add on that. Uh, NCSL, we do have a nuclear legislative working group. Um, Dan and I both staff that group made up of legislators all over the country who are either um, sort of interested in nuclear generation and maybe we have nuclear power plants in their district or, um, you know, have nuclear waste uh, going through their state or are interested in sort of these longer term waste questions. And so um, we meet on a regular basis. We certainly have a strong Nevada contingent. Um, for Tory in particular, we have several uh, Maryland legislators who participate in that group. If it's ever helpful, you know, we'd, we'd love to include legislative staff as well. That's something that we haven't had in the past. But if you, if anyone that's that's listening in on this session uh, would be interested in more information on that nuclear legislative working group, um, you know, please feel free to reach out to that. Happy to share sort of what the discussions are from the state legislative perspective around the country. Um, you know, we did have a, another question, and I think I'll push this back to Glenn. Um, you mentioned sort of um, in your energy transformation discussion, some of the utility regulatory models you sort of quickly referenced. Um, are there some kind of specific state examples of, you know, how states are addressing these utility regulatory models? Sure. Uh, thanks, Christy. Yeah, I would say, you know, there's been a lot of activity in this area. And while much of it, you know, much of it has been at the Public Utility Commission level, I think it's really important for um, policymakers to, to remember that the kind of the infrastructure, the, the regulatory regime under which the PUC operates is crafted and created by state legislators. So um, they're really kind of giving the boundaries and the environment within, within which the PUC operates. So um, it's really legislators that created and have the ability to, to help um, shape that regulatory approach. And um, they, they are, are doing that now to, to really, really help tailor it to a, a more modern uh, energy system. So uh, Hawaii, for instance, just recently their PUC um, adopted performance-based uh, regulation framework. Um, and this is as, as a result of legislation passed in 2018, which directed them really to do so. And, and the goal again is, is to break the, this direct link between investment and utility um, profits um, uh, and, and, or utility revenues and really make the connection between utility revenues and performance. So um, this can unlock new um, revenue streams for utilities when they reach, and, and this is the, the aim in Hawaii really, is when they, when they are supporting customer choice and uh, reaching uh, goals set by the state's clean energy um, policies, they can have opportunities to, to, to profit more, for instance. Um, or for addressing issues such as keeping keeping costs low um, for, for, for customers. Rhode Island, New York, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and there's a number of other states um, that both on the legislative level and at the commission level are, are exploring to varying degrees, um, transitioning to this more performance-based model, which is really you know, more appropriate for um, this, this transitioning grid. Uh, one other thing I would note is there, there's also a lot of activity um, around a, an area that is, is quite important, I think, and that's um, rate making and uh, time of use rates. So basically, 
Um, currently, most rates are you just pay kind of a set amount for how much you consume, no matter when. But uh, the way the electricity system works is there's um, varying prices that the utility pays for electricity that's delivered to customers. So um, sometimes it's really expensive to deliver electricity. And if customers, um, they're able to pass that, that um, visual or that data um, onto customers so that you pay more, for instance, during peak times, um, that will uh, basically produce a consumer response. Um, so a lot of states are looking at transitioning to these time of use rates and in California, much of California is transitioning. Um, uh, Colorado is looking at that, Excel Energy. And um, basically this will just allow the market to operate more smoothly. And uh, in the end, uh, reduce infrastructure costs since uh, it allows uh, customers to respond to, to pricing at different times of the day. So um, I think that's another area that's a very interesting um, policy um, activity where there's a lot of policy activity going on and a really critical, important area for the energy uh, transfer, or, uh, yeah, energy transformation for, for states. Thanks, Glenn. And uh, I think you bring up, it gets really complex really fast. I think you bring up a lot of really interesting points on just sort of uh, how energy policy is sort of at the forefront uh, in this sort of rapid energy sector change. And we're seeing t a ton of that related to sort of the role that state legislatures play when it comes to setting policies sort of around utilities and, and the future. Um, I know you mentioned our, our report on grid modernization, which touches on a lot of this as well. Um, so I would just give another plug to the group to um, check out that report if that's of interest and sort of thinking through um, all of NCSL's resources. You know, certainly we tried to identify some of the resources that we thought you might be most interested in. And, and you know, those are on, on the web page under the video screen. Um, but we have a whole host of other ways that we are interacting with legislators and legislative staff um, through webinars. We certainly in this virtual environment are setting up more sort of Zoom discussions on particular energy topics. Um, you know, we also have a number of groups. I already mentioned our nuclear legislative working group, but we also have an energy supply task force that is exploring a lot of these issues made up of state legislators and legislative staff interested in, in energy policy. Um, lastly, you know, in coordination with uh, Ben and our Washington, D.C. colleagues, we have uh, a standing committee, the Natural Resources and Infrastructure Committee, who's exploring a whole host of issues uh, besides energy. But certainly, you know, Ben, uh, maybe not if you agree, I think energy is taking up a lot of time right now. Um, and, and certainly even, you know, kind of going into the overlap with the transportation sector too. So um, I know that we're sort of hitting up on our, our time and there's other sessions today. We want to make sure everyone has a break. I guess I would turn it back to my colleagues quickly to see if anyone has any sort of final comments, wants to um, say anything regarding resources or ways that legislators and legislative staff um, can work with us at NCSL and how we can be a resource to them. Um, I, I would just pause here and see if anyone wants to kind of have the final word before we close out today. Hey, Chrissy, this is Ben. I'll just quickly uh, reiterate and thank you for mentioning that. Um, if anyone is interested in getting involved in the committee, um, you know, please feel free to reach out to myself. I'm happy to kind of you know, plug you into that. Um, it's a great way to meet other legislators as well um, and learn more about how federal policy impacts states. Thanks, Ben. Um, well, with that, you know, thank you all for tuning in today. We hope this was a useful overview of sort of what's going on in the energy sector and how state policies are uh, impacting the big changes that are taking place. Uh, we hope you can tune in um, this, for this afternoon's sessions as part of the State Policy 101 series and join us um, each Friday in February as we uh, continue these 101. So with that, thank you very much uh, and please feel free to reach out.